What's up? Doc Mike. Public Health on Call. By Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for November 27, 2020. Friday Q&A with Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo from the Center for Health Security. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 2 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former Secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I have the chance to catch up with Jennifer Nuzzo, Senior Scholar at the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins. I ask her a whole bunch of listener questions. Let's listen. Dr. Nuzzo, thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Answering Listener Questions. Thanks for having me. So the first question comes from someone who says, when I get tested for COVID-19, who gets access to my results? Could my name and phone number be reported to the health department? It should be. If you test positive for COVID-19, the health department needs to have your information so that they hopefully can contact you and start the process of contact tracing to figure out who you may have exposed and to let those folks know. I'm sensing a little reluctance in this question. What, What if somebody were to say, well, shouldn't it be up to me whether my results go to the health department? Sure. I can understand how it might be intimidating to have, you know, an agency that you haven't talked to before get this information. But Knowing who tests positive is really important for controlling this virus. We need to know where the cases are occurring and to analyze trends, but also, again, to start the process of contact tracing so that we can let other people who may have been exposed to you know so that they can stay home and hopefully not spread the virus onto others. Great. Here's another somewhat skeptical question. Could you explain how making bars close at 10 o'clock helps anything? Sure. So I don't think we have great data specifically about the impact of closing bars at 10 versus closing them entirely. Or, But I think the rationale is that the later the hour, the less likely people are to comply with safety protocols. Bars get tend to get crowded later at night. I've heard anecdotally that, you know, maybe once you're on your second or third beer, you might be less likely to maintain physical distance and, you know, kind of other public health recommendations. So I think when places are doing that, they're trying it as a way to potentially reduce transmission that results from people not adhering to protocols and, you know, potentially as a step before closing the bars entirely. Got it. Here's a question about the vaccine. How will we know whether vaccines work for children? Will my nine-year-old be able to get vaccinated when I do? So children aren't included in the ongoing studies that have been reported recently. And so children likely will not be among the first to receive the vaccine. And I think that maybe in part to make sure that there's a safe and effective vaccine for adults before the studies really get going with kids. Mm. So a few questions about people who have COVID. One is, my roommate and I both tested positive for COVID. Can we be in the same house together or should we isolate in our separate bedrooms and bathrooms? Could we make each other sicker? I think if you test positive for COVID, it's probably important to try to stay clear of everybody as much as possible, recognizing it's probably pretty hard in a household. But, you know, there's the very, very slim likelihood that one of you has a false positive test result. Again, these are exceedingly rare, so not common. But just in case, I think it's worth keeping your distance. Here's another one. I have recently recovered from COVID. Do I still have to wear a mask and avoid high-risk situations? Yes, you do. We don't know a whole lot about whether you can get um, infected subsequently. There have been reports of people being infected a second time, but it's also just important to show compliance with public health uh, mask recommendations. So you got to still wear a mask. Now there are a few questions about how to prevent infection. So here's a question. Is wearing more than one mask at a time helpful? Well, it can be helpful. And here's one way. Often, you know, we see this in healthcare worker situations where they may be wearing a protective, say, N95 mask, but they don't want to get it dirty so that they can reuse it. And so they may put a cloth mask or, you know, a surgical procedural mask over it. So there are some reasons to do that. And you may see people out in public doing that for that reason. Got it. Can mouthwash help prevent COVID? 
So this is a story that's been going around on the internet because of a non-peer-reviewed study that was um, a preprint. And just to be clear, the study did not involve humans. It involved a laboratory experiment. So no, there is absolutely no evidence that mouthwash will prevent people from getting COVID. Here's a question. Some people working out at my gym don't wear masks when on the rower or treadmill. How far away from them should I stay? And should I avoid using those machines when they're done? Ooh, yeah, I would say as far away as possible. And I would probably try to avoid that area after they've used it. You don't know if there's anything hanging around after they're gone, but people should be wearing a mask if they're going to go to gym. And ideally, you know, gyms are one of those places where, where things can spread. So if you're seeing people exercising and working out without wearing masks, I might be inclined to find another place to work out. Is that because when they're exhaling so forcefully, they can really spread the virus? Yes. I mean, you can imagine just how, you know, heavy breathing one gets if one's really getting a good workout. So it can put a lot of virus into the air. So we got a question from someone who writes, I am a professional Santa Claus. This seems like a seasonal question. I was wondering how safe it would be to use a wood and plexiglass divider approximately six foot wide by six foot tall. This event would be a couple of hours long, held outside under a big carnival type tent with two sides open. Do you feel that this setup would be reasonably safe even without a mask? So I hate that I have to rain on Santa Claus's parade here, but first of all, we should be wearing masks when we're around other people. And certainly if the plan is to have children sit on your lap, then that does not seem like a a safe um, activity. If you wanted to be outside and wave at children from a distance, um, that would be a different story. But really, masks and distance, you know, all of these things are additive and we should be doing it all, even with the plexiglass. Thank you. Um, I just want to end with some, you know, big picture questions. How do you put together what's happening right now in the United States with COVID? We are on a really worrisome trajectory. We have, since the beginning of November, really seen historic highs in terms of daily new cases. So the case numbers continue to accelerate. It looks less like a curve and almost a vertical climb at this point. And then we're also hearing about record high hospitalizations occurring in in most of the country. And that is particularly worrisome because you may have heard over the summer some good news about, you know, COVID deaths being lower than they had been in the spring. We have learned better how to clinically manage COVID. And, you know, I think there were some help in the summer by the fact that um, the cases tended to be younger. But all of this is subsequent to change. Young people can spread it to people who are vulnerable and more likely to die. And all of the kind of clinical tricks that people have learned in dealing with COVID is very much contingent on there being enough resources in hospitals and clinics to be able to provide to use those tricks. So I am really worried about what's to come. And, you know, it's getting colder and people are going to have a harder time kind of, you know, taking their socializing outdoors. They're going to retreat indoors. And we know that indoor environments are particularly um, ripe for spreading this virus. Holidays are coming. People are going to, may feel inclined to travel and to get together with, with family or friends. And, you know, the prospect of going somewhere to see people that you haven't seen Uh, recently and potentially to share a meal where you're likely not going to be wearing a mask. I mean, all of this creates multiple opportunities for there to be even yet more transmission of this virus in the U.S. So if you hear people on the news talking about how worried they are about the coming weeks, there's a really good reason for that. So what do you think is really important for everyone to do as we're headed towards Thanksgiving, the Christmas holidays? What do you advise? Really, those of us who can stay home as much as possible should. And, you know, all of the things that you've been hearing, wearing masks, keeping your physical distance, trying to limit your exposure to others, that's going to be really, really important in the coming weeks. Recognize that not everybody's able to do that. There are still people who have to go out and work and to show up at places. But for everyone else, the the more of us who can do that and to try to reduce spread in the overall community, we'll be helping to protect those people who are unable to stay home. Dr. Nozzo, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen-McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.